Dr. Land served five terms with the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Joining them, we also have Dr. Jennifer Roback Morse, who is the founder and president of the Ruth Institute. A committed career woman before having children, she earned a doctorate in economics and spent 15 years teaching at Yale University and George Mason University. And finally, on our panel, we have Stuart Epperson, who is the co-founder and chairman of, the, of Salem Communications. He serves as director of Salem Communications Holy Corporation and has been engaged in the ownership and operation of radio stations since 1961. In addition, he is a member of the board of directors at National Religious Broadcasters. Please, let's give a warm CPAC welcome to our panel. Thank you. The panel is called Fatherless America, but I think it just as easily be called fatherless America and big daddy government and the unhealthy marriage that that portends for the American people. You know, in the height of uh, segregation, the beginning of the civil rights uh, revolution, or actually in the middle of the civil rights revolution in the 1960s, the out of wedlock birth rate in the black community was less than 25%. Today, it's over 85%. But I'm not going to dive into statistics today. I, I think that you know many of our panelists are going to talk about these statistics. I think we should be, we know the problem. We know how profound the problem is, not just in the African American community, but in the white community, in the Latino community. It's an American problem. I think what we really need to talk about today, and I'm hoping that our distinguished panel will talk about our solutions to the problem. You know. Joe Biden, that uh, brilliant vice president of ours. <laughs> there are pearls of wisdom that even come from Joe Biden from time to time. And I recall when he was on Meet the Press and came out of the closet <laughs> in support of gay marriage. Um, and he was asked by, uh, I believe it was David Gregory, you know, what was it that changed your mind on uh, same-sex marriage? And he said, gosh darn it, that will and grace <laughs> and that was actually a pearl of wisdom because the reality is is that our entertainment culture dominates our culture and I know as conservatives we tend to write off Hollywood despise Hollywood um, rightfully demonize Hollywood but we've got to get engaged in Hollywood we have to engage our popular culture we have to do what I believe Dr. Uh, Morris, one of our panels, panelists here says, we have to make marriage, traditional marriage, cool in America. That is where the battle is gonna be fought. I'm not saying that we should not fight the battles in court, or in our state legislatures, or in Congress, or the Supreme Court. But what I am saying is we're the definition of marriage has become more expansive and a bit more creative over the last few decades. That battle has been uh, fought in the streets and in our culture, in our schools. And I know that Hollywood, big Hollywood, and our universities are dominated by secular progressives. But nevertheless, as conservatives, we have the responsibility to engage these institutions. So with that, let me bring up our first panelist. Uh, Charles Butler is an old person, personal privilege here. Charles Butler is an old friend of mine. Uh, he is a soon-to-be nationally syndicated radio talk show host based in Chicago, but you can hear him throughout the Midwest, and pretty soon you'll be able to hear him all across the country. He's not only a radio talk show host, but he's an institution in the community and one of our more important conservative warriors from Chicago, Charles Butler. Good afternoon. Thank you, Nigel, for that warm welcome. It's a privilege to, to be here at CPAC and see so many wonderful, like-minded people. I just, when we have seven minutes, and I'm used to talking three hours, so I'm going to get started. Uh, in the, in the, I don't know what this is, but in the summer, 
1966. I was uh, about 13 years old. My mother always had us read a book. I had my brothers and I read books that were over our reading level, like I read Johnson and Masters uh, the year before and had to pull out a thesaurus and a, uh, a dictionary. I didn't realize what she was doing was helping me to uh, comprehend uh, words and learn the meaning of words and help me on the ACT and the SAT, which I scored very high on. And this was before we knew we were black, we were colored, and needed some help. Uh, but um, Moynihan released a report in 1965 that it was called the Negro Family, the Case for National Action. When we got this topic, you know, I, I looked at the topic and I'm going, you know, we're dealing with this again. Here we are, here I am, basically 40 some odd years later and I'm still talking about fatherless black folks. So when we talk about fatherlessness, that's what we generally reference, black families. Uh, Daniel Moynihan was victimized, as many of you know called a racist and, uh, you know, people the, from the civil rights movement said it's the, the, the victims are being victimized. That's where that started, if, if, for those of you too young to remember or forgot. Well, Daniel Moynihan's forecast about the Great Society of Social Programs could be, have come to fruition and uh, nothing could be further from the truth in his projection that these programs were very detrimental to the black family. Uh, I remember my mother was a cosmetologist, a licensed cosmetologist. So she had a number of black women who came through our neighborhood. She had a salon in the basement. And uh, my mom and dad were married for, you know, 20 years. And I just like to say this, in listening to these women talk, because I used to go in the basement and, you know, chat with these uh, women about various subjects, I used to hear them say, around the mid-60s, and this was when ADC changed because see, aid to dependent children was created by the Social Security Act of 35, but black women weren't allowed on it. In fact, my grandmother worked for white women who were on ADC because black women weren't allowed on it because they were considered part of the workforce, which people don't know. So I tell black women who profess to be feminists, the feminist movement is not about you, baby. You've always worked since you've been on these shores. Now, <clears throat> the, you know, uh, when we talk about the, the civil rights, uh, the uh, March on Washington, for instance, in 1963, which is what is interesting to me is that many people don't know that was a march for jobs. Now, of course, Niger would know because his father was head of court. He was right there in front with King. Uh, and, uh, but it was, a, it was a march for jobs because uh, JFK, John Kennedy, had promised Martin Luther King that he was going to eliminate Black unemployment, which was 6.2% at the time, and totally unacceptable and unheard of. But he didn't do it. And Adam Clay Powell became one of the most prolific uh, legislators because he always attached a clause that Negroes must have federal jobs and federal jobs when money is spent. Well, of course, with the Civil Rights Movement, Civil Rights Act, a lot of that, all that went away. And we allowed black women on welfare. And what I used to hear in the basement was, I'm going to get rid of that Negro so that I can be on my own and make my own decisions because at the time, believe it or not, the government was paying women more money than men were working in the plant, working union jobs 40 hours a week. And I used to talk to my father about this and he talked about how families were decimated because the government was allowed to give these women who were divorced, allow them on welfare, aid to, the, aid to dependent children. Now, one of the things, I, I, I'm because there are going to be a lot of numbers passed around here, we, uh, we can talk about those, you know, like uh, uh, children born out of wedlock to blacks now are 72.5%, whites 29%, which is where it was in the uh, early 60s for blacks. So this phenomenon of marriage, or the lack of marriage in our country, is showing you where we're going. We are declining. The, the, the lack of traditional marriage is taking this country in a direction that we will not recover from. And right now on the agenda, as many of you know, gay marriage. Now, what, what an oxymoron that is, gay marriage, to me. But uh, again, then again, I didn't discover that my daughter or my son was gay, so I haven't changed my position yet. But it's a moral thing when it comes to me. <laughs> but, you know, I, I just want to share just a couple of things and I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I've had two, two instances that were very close to me that this fatherless thing comes, comes into place. Michael Jordan is a personal friend of mine, Michael Jordan, a basketball player. 
and uh, a woman just filed a paternity suit against him for, you know, supposedly having this child out of wedlock. Now, you have, must understand, this woman that he had this child with, supposedly, was a sex instructor, so she clearly knew how babies got it. But she chose to have a baby because guess what? Michael Jordan's a multimillionaire. And many of you, and I was going to put this slide up, but all of you remember the slide where the, on Sports Illustrated where they have a little baby in the caption, where's my daddy? Well, these women chose to have babies on their own, on a booty call. And I, I just hate to break it down like that, but that's exactly what happened. There was not two words mentioned, love or marry. Now believe me, black men know how to ask someone to marry them and have children and conceive. I have, I've seen too many times where people were basically forced into either marrying a woman they didn't want to marry because they had a baby, or being an absentee father. This morning, over at uh, TV One, I taped uh, a segment with Roland Martin. It wasn't on fatherlessness, by the way. It was on conservatives and black conservatives. By the way, Ken Blackwell was there. But the makeup artist, and she asked me about, you know, what was I doing at the CPAC, and I explained, I'm going to be speaking on a panel this afternoon about father, fatherlessness. And she said, you know, it's a woman's issue. She said, my three-year-old son asked me recently, where was his daddy? And I said, what did you say? She said, I felt guilty because this man had three other children that I didn't know about. This was his fourth. And she said, he's not in my son's life. And I feel bad because my son doesn't have a father. She said, but I won't have another one without a dad. And all I'm saying to you all, and I will say to America is, that we're still using a, 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 a pre-1965, pre-pill solution to a 2013 problem, which is people conceiving babies out of love, and, and well, I should say without love, and within outside of marriage. And with that, I'm going to leave the mic and turn it over to our next guest. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Um, our next speaker really needs no introduction. Dr. Richard Land is a living institution. He is the president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, a position that he's held for more than two decades. He's been a nationally syndicated radio talk show host and one of our important moral leaders. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Land. Well, it's a delight to be here and to share the stage with my colleagues, and especially Niger. I, I'm old enough to remember when your father was there. And uh, in fact, uh, I vividly remember Dr. King's speech. I was a 16-year-old um, had just surrendered to the ministry, a 16-year-old teenager on August 28, 1963, and I heard Dr. King's speech and um, understood from that moment on that it was not enough to just believe that racism was sin, it was my responsibility to speak up against it whenever I encountered it. My subject is fatherlessness, and it is an epidemic in America. We've conducted a more than four decade experiment on whether or not fathers are optional accessories in the rearing of healthy adults. And the answer is a resounding no. They are not optional accessories. They are necessary. The single greatest advantage <clears throat> that an American child can have is to be born into a home with a mother and a father who are married to each other and who stay married to each other. <clears throat> it's called the nuclear family. It used to be called the normal family. Now it's the nuclear family. God intended for every child to have a mother and a father. And as you can imagine, I have some profound policy disagreements with former Vice President Al Gore. But I hope that my son can say of me at my funeral what Al Gore said about his father, Al Gore Sr. 
He said, children who grow up in homes with strong fathers have a sense of security other children don't have. From my very earliest memories, he said, I all, by the way my father treated my mother every day, I knew my father was never going to leave. Every child deserves that. Being raised in a nuclear family trumps everything else. It trumps race, it trumps ethnicity, it trumps IQ, it trumps rural, urban, suburban, exurban. It trumps everything. Children from homes with a married mother and father are seven times <clears throat> less likely to ever live in poverty. They're six times less likely to commit suicide. They're less than half as likely to ever commit a crime. They're less than half as likely to become pregnant out of wedlock. They develop better academically and socially. They're far more likely to finish high school, far more likely to finish college, far more likely to finish graduate school, far more likely to get married, far more likely to stay married, far less likely to experience either physical or sexual abuse. They are healthier physically and emotionally when they reach adulthood. I have here a study done by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Family structure and children's health in the United States. Findings from the National Health Interview Survey. A very comprehensive study done. And it came, and you're going to be just shocked when you find out the government went to all of this expense. And here's the conclusion. We find that children who grow up in nuclear families were healthier. They had better access to health care. They were less likely to have definite or severe emotional or behavioral difficulties than children living in non-nuclear families. Now, she studied seven kinds of families. The nuclear family, the blended family, the cohabiting family, the single family, and blended families were better than single families, but none came even close to God's design. The nuclear family. She said that uh, children living in nuclear families were less likely to be poorly behaved or to have definite or severe emotional or behavioral difficulties. These findings are consistent with previous research that has concluded that children living with two parents were advantaged relative to children living in other types of families. Wow. God's design was right. God's design works. And you heard the previous speaker say that, that single parent families are now in the white community where they were in the black community in the 1960s. If you really want to get depressed, read Charles Murray's new book, Coming Apart, where he factors out race just to deal with white families. And he discovers that there are two white Americans. They live in Belmont and Fishhook. Belmont is thriving, fish hooks in trouble. And the single difference? Fathers who stay married to the mothers of their children and rear their children. We've conducted a 40 year experiment on whether or not fathers are optional accessories in the rearing of healthy adults. They are not. But up until now, no one's actually been crazy enough to argue that. Mothers are optional accessories in the rearing of healthy children. But that's exactly what President Obama said last Father's Day, and it's exactly what the same-sex marriage movement says. Two men can do as good a job of raising a child as a mother and a father can. That's just plain goofy. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. Dr. Jennifer Roback Morris is president and co-founder of the Ruth 
Ruth Institute. And the Ruth Institute has been on the front line of protecting and promoting the institution of marriage, the traditional institution of marriage, as it's been known for a millennium or more. One of the things I really like about the Ruth Institute, I went to your website, <laughs> is um, their policy of promoting the institution of marriage in our popular culture, which I think is critical. It's the front line of the battle. And making marriage cool, I like that. Um, I'm sure you'll talk a little bit about that. But please give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Morris. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me here at CPAC. It's an honor to be here and to talk about this problem of fatherlessness. I would like to say at the beginning, after this very nice uh, uh, plug for the Ruth Institute, uh, that uh, we have a uh, extensive uh, newsletter that we send out once a week. And today, I am going to raffle off a whole set of Ruth Institute educational products if you will sign up for my newsletter. So my friend here, whom I borrowed from Dr. Land, is circulating cards. If you'll give me your name and complete address so I can mail it to you if you win, um, uh, we'll, we'll enter you into the raffle for the, for the Ruth Institute educational products. So the topic here is fatherlessness in America. But the focus of my remarks will be somewhat different. I want to talk about manhood in America. Now, if you'll notice, I'm the only woman on this panel. And several speakers have already alluded to the fact that there are certain issues that men are not allowed to talk about. Issues that have been defined by the feminist left as so-called women's issues, men are not allowed to have an opinion on those things. Uh, and the left has made a concerted effort to marginalize men from the family and from even discussions about these issues. In popular culture, men are depicted either as violent, dangerous, sexual predators that no woman should have anything to do with, or men are presented as inept, bumbling buffoons who are the butt of the joke, whom no self-respecting woman should have anything to do with. Now, what I'd like to talk with, talk with you about is two things. I have two themes I want to talk about in our seven minutes that I have here. First, I want to talk with you about what it is that fathers do for a free society. What it is that manhood contributes to a free society. And I want to argue that this is a, not just a social conservative value, but a fiscal conservative value. It is just a conservative value that we need men, we need fathers in the family, unashamed to be men. The second thing I want to talk with you about is why it is that the left has put so much effort into marginalizing fathers and men from the family. Because you have to pay attention to this. If they think the subject is important, then we need to think that the subject is important. And we have many people in the conservative movement who do not grasp, I think, the seriousness of the social issues, who do not realize all that is at stake in uh, all of these issues that really and truly many of them frankly are simply afraid to talk about because the left has basically booby-trapped a whole set of concepts and ideas and words so that if you touch them it explodes in your face and so therefore everybody just leaves it alone. Well every time they booby-trap something they take ground because we are no longer even fighting for it. So I want to convince you that fatherhood is, is important and to do that I want to say just a few words about marriage itself. What is marriage? Well, marriage is a pre-political institution that has existed in every known society that you can think of. It has nothing to do with the Constitution, in a sense, right? It well predates the Constitution. It predates any known religion, like unless you want to go to the Hebrew Bible, where it's the very first thing that God creates after he creates the cosmos. He creates a, a social institution called marriage. Okay, so marriage is a pre-political ancient institution. What I want to point out to all of our conservative friends, because presumably if, if you're not a libertarian yourself, you know someone who might be. Presumably you all know people like this. We like the free market in the conservative movement. It's CPAC. Everybody likes the free market. right? My doctorate's in economics, by the way, not anything having to do with child development. <laughs> but my doctorate's in economics. Why do free market people like the free market? Well, one thing we like about it is that we recognize that the free market is an institution for social cooperation, right? It allows strangers to cooperate, collaborate, get a lot of cool stuff done with a minimal amount of effort. Really, the government doesn't have to be involved in it at all. I want to point out 
that marriage is the most basic unit of social cooperation that doesn't need the government to be involved. I mean, after all, a man and a woman come together, usually needing no prompting whatsoever. They spontaneously and naturally come together and they can produce a child together. And what do they have now? They have an incentive and a reason to stay together. They have a common project. And what do the man and woman create? They create a little society, a little self-sustaining, self-regenerating uh, society called the family, called the home. And you know what is true about that society? It means, first of all, the, it flows naturally from the body, from the human body. That is male-female differentiation. We're drawn to one another. The need to love is written into the human body. And new life springs spontaneously from that act of love. Now, the thing of it is that um, the left cannot control what goes on in that little society of the family. And that's one of the things that they don't like about it. Now, what, goes, what is the father's role here? The father's role is to provide and protect the family. And they do it naturally and spontaneously. The father can keep order inside the family and inside the community without government and typically without the slightest bit of violence. A father can keep order just with a dirty look. You know the dad look? Okay. So this is a very efficient system. Libertarians should be in awe of this. And think about it. How many little boys want to grow up to be sheriffs or firemen? Think about that. It's a desire to protect the weak, to help the innocent. That is what we need from men. That is what we need for men to do. And this is what the left despises about the family. They cannot control it. And government is not necessary for it. And I want you to understand that this, this hatred of the nuclear family goes all the way back to Frederick Engels in the 19th century. He literally said that the husband is the bourgeois and the wife is the proletariat. I have a booklet here called The Socialist Attack on the Family. I have a few copies up there along with some other literature if you care to pick that up. The fact is sexual differences are built into the human body and the fact that we are different is all it takes to trigger a leftist hissy fit over inequality. And that's exactly what it is. They see monogamy and private property as flip sides of the same evil, oppressive, terrible coin. And they have introduced the language and the reality of class warfare into the home. That is what the early feminist movement did. That is why so many men are afraid to speak out about it, because they don't want to be seen as oppressors. But that is what they have done. And so I want the men in this room, particularly any man hearing my voice today, what I would ask of you is that you embrace your manhood, that you not be ashamed, that you not be some kind of metro, metro, metrosexual whatever it is, that is sort of neutered, okay? That there's nothing wrong with being a man. And that we need for you to do this. We need those who will take responsibility for protecting the weak and who will help sustain the family. There is nothing to be ashamed of. Thank you very much. I think one of the lines I think uh, we burn in my uh, brain after this uh, panel is, is done is that uh, men and women don't need any prompting to come together. Lord knows that's true. <laughs> um, I believe, and if I'm wrong, uh, correct me, but I believe uh, Ms. Phyllis Shafley uh, of the Eagle Forum has come to join us and is in the audience. Could you please stand if I'm correct on that? Thank you for coming. A warrior in, in this battle for the future of our country uh, for decades. Thank you for joining us today. Last but certainly not least uh, is Stuart Epperson. He's the co-founder and chairman of one of the most important media networks in the country, Salem Communications. But he also has a charity that promotes in a very direct way uh, fatherhood and role models. I'm sure he'll talk about that today. Give him a warm welcome, Stuart. Tell me on the way in, he said, uh, let uh, men who want to marry men, let them marry men. Women who want to marry women, let them marry women. And in two generations,